Can everyone see my my screen? Yes. Okay. So I hope everyone enjoyed uh, some time with family over the Easter break. Uh, we do have to move forward uh, with a purpose to cover the rest of the material to to, uh, to adequately cover uh, the rest of the essentials in remaining modules. And one of the things that is important to emphasize, we have a few of our students who have not yet submitted either option for the solution. And by 9 a.m. Thursday, it's going to be important to have that in place. You have to have access to forensic tools. Uh, you have to be able to use them for some trial and error. You have to um, become familiar with those things. And we're going to be using uh, selected resources. And so uh, if you have not yet submitted a solution option, you're going to need to do that before 9 a.m. We'll have to move forward without you. And you're going to be at a severe disadvantage if we don't get those in place. I just wanted to share that matter with a bit of firmness so that people understand um, if we had any additional latitude for additional extensions or delays, we've played that out. So um, one of the things that I did not do on this assessment was to, um, we had a few students that weren't with us uh, when we covered the matrix and I basically explained how Tripwire has, uh, it's an automated hashing system for an entire system. And uh, Tripwire is capable of generating hashes for every file, every system in an entire organization, and then logging any changes to critical components. And I said something to that effect. I explained that Tripwire was like, um, you know, like an automated hashing tool on steroids. And uh, we also talked about SCCM and how it um, it automates the collection and analysis of logs. And so in a previous recording, there were specifics about the matrix that I called out in a class session. And um, some of that is in the references, but I went into some depth in that session. Uh, I'm gonna make sure that that's posted online if it isn't out there already. And I want you to know that the retake for this assessment will include more specifics about the tools on this matrix and what they're used for. So before we go any further, I, I just want to share with everyone, uh, you, you're going to want to reference this matrix um, quite a bit more between the time you uh, work the retake for the assessment and the first cumulative exam that's coming right up. And we talked about Splunk and, and how it's, um, it, it's basically good with analyzing log data, all different types of data and data without specific uh, format or framework. So you have this um, freeform data right now called NoSQL and other types of uh, big data out on the internet. And it doesn't really uh, comply with specific uh, or traditional legacy uh, database standards, but it's still huge. Those are still huge data sets and they're part of online systems. A good example of this is Facebook. And uh, on Thursday, we're going to basically touch on the interest 
that has just uh, been raised, Facebook lost um, personal information for 553 million users about a year ago. And they're playing it down like it's no big deal. But I'm going to be sending you an article about how it's a very big deal. <laughs> and the fact that uh, if you have a Facebook account, you're like one of 553 million people worldwide whose personal information is now sitting in someone's hands. And that kind of brings sharp relief to the whole importance of digital forensics and some of the tools that we use to find the needle in a haystack. Um, I didn't stress this uh, as much as I probably should have in class, but when it comes to uh, acquisition, there's um, a particular there's a particular stage of acquisition. <clears throat> It is considered to be the most challenging or greatest cha challenge, and I'm going to revisit that when we uh, pull up the assessment items, but I want to call that out as well. Um, that, that concept is clearly stated in um, the final version of the study guide, and, and there were some points that were made up here and there in class, but uh, in any case, Another thing that we wanted to make sure people understood in terms of the level of challenge, um, recovering data out of live RAM or memory is by far uh, considered one of the higher level skills. It's just really difficult to learn those, uh, learn those uh, types of things. But any, in any case, uh, I just wanted to take some time to review those points with you to make sure that as you prepare for the retake, uh, you spend a little more time on the matrix. There weren't very many assessment items that hit on the finer points of this listing, but, but there will be um, going forward, okay? So if I ask you about, um, you know, what tools would be good to identify patterns in freeform data? Uh, you'd probably say Splunk, right? For data without uh, legacy structure, be Splunk. Um, some of the limitations and prerequisites and stuff. I could have had a question in there about what's the most common prerequisite for all, for all tools, right? Prior authorization. And uh, education awareness and training at, at some level, not just with the people who use the tools, but people who are the subjected to the use of the tools, right? The stakeholders when you're doing the analysis. It's, you know, it's something that should have stood out. And uh, I, I don't know if I made a big point of that either, but any questions about the taxonomy, um, additional points of emphasis, and stuff like that? Any points, any questions? Has anyone else heard about what happened with Facebook? 553 million records compromised in somebody's hands. No one? Yeah, they're doing a pretty good job of trying to keep that under wraps, aren't they? Just saying. Um, all right. So today's date is 6 April. Um, all right, so let's look at our assessment. Um, there were five possible points you could earn on the assessment. Uh, basically, the scores were lower than usual. I don't know if that had to do with the Easter break. And uh, Holy Week, um, I do know people had a lot of additional activities and obligations for family. Um, the average was about a 50 for the class. So that's it's quite a bit lower uh, than we normally see, about 20 points lower. But some of that is, is due to the fact that uh, folks uh, basically made an attempt with their first um, 
log their first attempt on the first version of the assessment, when you look at when people took the assessments, a lot of folks took them right before the deadline. And um, some actually, there was one person in particular that took it afterwards as a matter of grace. And it was sort of a shotgun, hey, you know, shotgun wedding, hey, get, get your attempt online so you can do the retake and you can do the reconciliation. Um, I do hope everyone understands that going forward, we're not going to have a latitude to extend deadlines or to ask people to try something in the next day or so. Like, again, I just want to stress the runway, the additional runway is gone. If the plane doesn't leave the runway soon, we're not going to cover the essentials we need for the end of the class so that when we finish in May, we finish strong. And I, I can't, I can't really allow that to happen. I wouldn't, wouldn't be a decent instructor if we just kept uh, doing this. So in any case, uh, we did have a high score that ran um, around 70, 70%. 70 uh, so that's, that's pretty good for a first attempt, especially when you consider the amount of material that was, uh, that was covered. So um, we're gonna go ahead and pull up the uh, item analysis at this point and take a look at the, the items that proved most challenging uh, for students in the class. And then later today, we're going to post both take options for both assessments and uh, it's going to be really important for everybody to get out there and to do the retake as soon as possible good morning good morning sorry i'm late alarm didn't go off no i understand we're just about ready to start there were some other i'll go ahead and post this recording online you're going to want to make sure that you uh, catch the other uh details that were shared with folks this morning okay so if we look at the item analysis on this should clear momentarily Uh, there is an available analysis from Sunday. Uh, what's going on here? Okay. Can everybody see the screen? Sure, yes, sir. Yes. So the level of difficulty, according to statistical analysis, we had two easy questions, 16 medium questions and four hard questions. That's an interesting uh, breakout. Uh, the fact that most of them were considered to be medium and difficulty, um, that's, that's not a concern. What we don't want is too many that are too easy or too many that are too hard. Um, the poor or cannot calculate questions were probably questions everyone um, answered correctly for. But what we'll do is sort, like we always do, by average score um, from highest to lowest. If it's a multiple choice item that was worth a quarter of a point and the class average was a 0 0.22, you see this was flagged as a poor question or cannot calculate uh, question. Um, most everyone got this correct. Uh, the multiple answer questions would be worth more. So, uh, you know, this is something we're going to spend some time on. But um, let me go ahead and just print a copy of this before it. Um, so we have a matter of record. I 
we'll start at the bottom and work our way up. So this is obviously a case where it wasn't uh, true that everybody, you know, if the average score was zero, um, that's not a case where everybody got it right, obviously. So let's take a look at uh, this particular question. Which common open source digital forensic tool provides the ability to capture raw image data for a disk acquisition? And um, when we say raw image data, we're talking about the context is disk image. Does everybody see that we're talking about capture of raw data for disk acquisition, right? So we're talking about disk acquisition, DD. The correct answer is DD. It's a common tool, it's an open source tool. You don't have to use Kali or a forensic toolkit. You can use any Linux distribution. And DD has uh, software switches that are built in that prevent uh, corruption of data as it's written. So, so there you have it. Um, it looks like uh, a number of students selected the first option based on this, I'm guessing, this word right here, image. So it had to do with hex viewer. So the clues in this are open source. It's an open source. It has to do with disk acquisition and it has to do with disk image or disk data, the whole disk basically. So when you see raw image data or disk acquisition, you're talking about grabbing the entire hard disk, right? The DD command. Any questions about this item? So the DD command is specifically what, what you'd use for this, not the hex viewer. Why not the hex viewer? Well, the, the hex viewer has to do with graphic images like JPEGs. The context here, we're not talking about graphical images to analyze, you know, the contents of of a, of a picture we're not talking about pictures uh, like you take with your smartphone we're talking about a disk image so so those those terms can be you'll see the 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 use of the term image quite frequently does that help answer your question yes sir okay so the hex viewer would be useful to examine the header of a graphic image and or let's say another disk file and if you see the phrase xif in the header that means oh this is actually a graphic image it's not a word document it's not a powerpoint it's not a music file it's actually a graphic image it means somebody was trying to hide an image um well, there's another question on the assessment to that effect Okay, moving right along. Uh, yeah, multiple choice. Are there essential records? You are hired by a large organization. So, so this is one thing that you're going to see more of in our assessments. And I just want you to understand when we have discussions in class or I mean, there's only so much of that I can capture in a study guide. A lot of the forensic scenarios are relative and the details in that scenario are important. So we have a lot of questions that require, you know, a review of the details for a given scenario. And that's, that, that's something you're gonna see more and more of. So you're hired by a large organization with a dedicated and certified IT staff and they operate a Microsoft Active Directory domain. Upon examination of your first system, you notice that no system logs are to be found. Well, the only way that's gonna happen is if there's uh, a group policy object that enforces the storage of system logs to happen on SCCM. So this was something we mentioned in class briefly, but it's also in your study guide. And uh, there are some 
details about that in the in the addendum. It says what action should you take to quickly and efficiently access these essential records? So the criteria for the scenario are this is a well organized, uh, very technical organization, right? And they have a lot of deep assets because they're they're going full school. This is a Fortune 500 or a government agency. You know, they have they have a fully dedicated and certified IT staff. That means they're going to be doing best practices to manage their environment. And yes, they are doing some things with group policy objects uh, in the Active Directory domain. They can enforce certain criteria on a system. They can enforce uh, firewall rules. They can enforce um, the disabling of noisy network protocols like NetBIOS, stuff like that. Um, they can enforce that people can't pull up a login screen and see other people's logins plainly displayed on the screen. Those are the types of things that happen in a corporation. You don't see who was logged in last. Uh, and that's done with a GPO, right? The idea is that you don't have any logs that are normally found, but this is a shop that's run by people who know what they're doing. So when you look at the answer choices here, I mean, yes, people could have been attacked by a very gifted advanced persistent threat. And there could be some tactics, techniques, and procedures for a hacker that meet that kind of situation, but that's, that's not a good fit for the scenario. If you examine the system logs for the domain controllers, um, we never really talked a whole lot about domain controllers. That's kind of a bogus answer. Um, if you had no logs to be found, but you had competent IT staff, it, it's, un, it's unlikely that uh, domain controller logs would have indicators that there's an advanced persistent threat on another machine somewhere else. What I'm saying is, is that in a properly configured Active Directory domain, the domain controller logs would have details about changes to the Active Directory database, to domain configurations, to a whole variety of things, but that wouldn't have anything to do with what what's found on that first system. So you look at the first workstation or the first laptop and, uh, oh, there's no logs, right? So in other words, you're fishing in the wrong barrel. That's why this is not a good, not a good answer choice, right? Uh, if you disable all the group policy objects in the domain, nobody selected that one. That would neither be quick or efficient, right? So, the only one that makes sense is to request from the IT staff. And, and if you notice on the matrix and in the study guide, it talks about if you have an active directory scenario, if you have centralized security account management, you know, coordinating with the IT staff is something that uh, is a good thing to do. And it's indicated, especially if you have, um, live things going on in machines you want the it staff to change passwords you want to coordinate with them to gain access to live systems and so on so you're going to be working closely with it staff most often in many organizations the dedicated and certified it staff are also people you might consider to be the d e f r the digital evidence first responders they're the first on the scene they're gonna realize, oh, something's deeper here. We need to call in the specialist, the DES. That's the digital evidence specialist. And, and there is a kind of a difference in scope of activity and responsibilities and interests between DEFR and DEF, DES. A lot of certified IT staff are also certified in, in, um, in incident handling. So, so they are literally certified as DEFR or incident handling because the IT staff is the first on the scene. Um, in any case, the system center configuration manager has to do with consolidation of logs. Uh, does anyone have any questions about this?
No questions. Okay. Moving right along. So, a legacy bank. When we say that, when we say the word legacy, what we mean is traditional, old school. They've hired you to perform digital forensics at the 45 branch locations they serve customers and perform financial services. They use older, unsupported versions of Microsoft Office to create and modify digital record. What implications does this have for you as a forensic investigator? Um, there's a plainly stated element of the addendum, and I think this is also mentioned in your study guide, that part of the situational awareness and um, the context is preparing for the environment. And if you have older versions of Office, um, how many of you know or don't know that if you have an old Word document, it doesn't always open in the new Word? I mean, there's like some compatibility issues sometimes. You can you can get fil you can install filters so that you can open older versions with a new version of Microsoft Word, but then it it wants to bark at you and convert to a new version. If you're a forensic specialist, you don't want to convert to a new version of Word the organization doesn't even possess. In that case, you're modifying the data files. But that's a common thing. That's actually a thing. Um, in terms of the other answers, it says uh, you must obtain file conversion tools from Microsoft so that more current supported applications are used. Um, in the context of the work you're doing for this bank, if you convert to a new version of Word that they don't even use, that's going to create an issue for the bank. So that that wouldn't be a good option um, compared to the other answers. Uh, it says here, you must notify the management of a legacy bank. They do not meet federal requirements. Um, that's a reasonable answer, but it's not as important as getting the job done. If they are using older unsupported versions of Microsoft Office, that's not the same as using older unsupported versions of an operating system, the system software itself. And federal organizations have to meet standards. They have to be, they have to use current stuff. This is a private organization. It's a legacy bank and they have 45 branch locations. I'm gonna share a quick story with you. I was in a local bank recently and I picked up on the fact that they had like, I don't know, Windows 7, might've been older than that, might've been Windows 98. It was ancient. And uh, I, they wanted to know about online banking. They said, hey, we want you to know that we do online banking and uh, we wanted to ask if you were interested in our online banking services today. And I smiled at the clerk at the counter and I said, I introduced myself and I said, I'm a professor at the university and I do cybersecurity. I want you to know that you're using an older unsupported version of Microsoft Office or Microsoft Windows, the operating system. Well, because they're a private bank, they're not a federal organization and nor do they receive federal money. So they don't receive federal grants. They don't use federal, they, they don't, um, part of their revenue stream doesn't include, like if you were a nonprofit organization and you received a federal grant and you'd have to meet federal standards, but this is a commercial organization and they can choose to be as outdated as they want. So if you, if you're well, so I'm, I'm telling you this, if you notify the management that they do not meet federal requirements, that's not entirely accurate because they're a private organization that does not receive federal funding. They do have to meet federal standards for reporting incidents and uh, compromises, but federal organizations that receive federal funds have to meet federal standards. 
which means they can't use unsupported versions of the operating system or software. If you're private, you can do anything. Um, not that it's good to do anything, but I wanted to draw out that distinction. And once again, this question is framed as a scenario, right? So what am I saying? The details in each scenario are there intentionally. There, most details in a scenario serve a useful purpose, and it's if you're if you're reading the question and taking your time, they'll they'll guide your assessment and selection of the uh, item answers. Okay, are there any questions about this item in particular? None that come to mind. Okay. Yeah, I can't tell you, I'd like to tell you which bank <laughs> so that you can run there and withdraw all your money. <laughs> it's not a good, not a good practice for us to do that. But if you notice that uh, older unsupported versions, it, it was ironic. They're like, yeah, we do online stuff. And I said, well, if you're online, you want to be secure. You can't be secure if you're using unsupported stuff, right? So, so yeah, when they get breached, I'm not talking about if this bank gets breached. I'm saying when they get breached. Why? Because they're using unsupported versions of the operating system and software. Well, if they were to require my services, I'd have to have older versions of the operating system and the applications to help them. And there are ways to get those and to have those on hand. So. It's part of situational awareness. Okay, next item is a multi-answer question. So um, that was worth, I think, a half a point. So it says you use WinHex to view a Word document. So when you're using a hex editor, most often you're looking inside the digital file format to look at the header, this first line, to see if there's anything in the plain text. So this is the digital hexadecimal characters that the, that the data itself, the ones and zeros represent. This is how it renders on screen. And the hex editor shows in the header, there's an exif. So the first thing that you got to know is, okay, the file is an EXIF data. Is EXIF data? It's a it's a JPEG image, right? It's not a Word document, even though it is. It says Bayshot.doc. This is an example that's in your book verbatim, and the author talks about this and explains all this. And then the author also explains. I, I make mention of this in the study guide as well. Um, Given the scenario, use of a non-standard format may reflect the intent to conceal or deceive. Why would somebody take a JPEG and name it .docx? The screen will probably pop up and say, hey, are you sure you want to change the extension? Because you're not going to be able to open this in the software that this was created in. The person has to intentionally do that, right? What are they trying to do, most likely? Right. They're trying to conceal or deceive most of the time. It is not typically an accident that data files are in are misnamed with the wrong extension. The operating system literally says, hey, are you sure you want to do that? Let's demonstrate. I'll just create a fictional uh jsk right if you change a file name extension the file <laughs> might become unusable are you sure you want to change it i mean you could be in a hurry maybe somebody did that for you because they hacked your system that's always possible but most often when somebody has a file name that means business and it's consistent with the context of business they perform that that doesn't usually it's not usually an accident and it's not not typically the case right the file may be openly viewed using paint 
despite the DOCX file extension. Again, the author mentions this, says if you have the header of a file shows EXIF, open it up in a graphics tool like Paint or, or, um, or Viewer, right? So you can, you can go into here and then open with, take your pick, photos, paint 3D, paint, graphics editors, and so on. Um, and it'll, it'll open right up. What are the other two choices? Uh, the file is incorrectly named and may be renamed with a forensic tool to allow proper processing. Okay. Uh, one of the things we don't do with a tool is change the data. If we change the data file with the tool, then I mean, what we want to do is analyze the existing data file in its original format with the tool. If we change the file and then try to get on a witness stand to testify that we did not ourselves modify the data, um, we're going to be all wet. This, this is not a good answer choice because, well, you don't want to change the data file. You want to analyze it as it is. Um, you can, when you're taking copies of the original file, if you want to see it, you can uh, rename it with a forensic tool to allow proper processing. But we just said you don't need to rename it to view it and to properly process it with a forensic tool, this tool already called out, hey, this is a graphics file. So it's already been properly processed. I think the logic of the answer is kind of barfed. It, it did fool a number of you and you, you said, oh yeah, um, I know that wording is tricky, but one of the things that we want to draw attention to, and, and so uh, I'm glad that we're talking about this, uh, you want to use the forensic tools to analyze um, the natural uh, data file, and, and you might you might modify it to dig deeper for rare occasions, but that's not normally the process. Um, if it's a forensic tool, the forensic tool is designed to work around that in the first place. So you 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 can change it and look at it um, if you don't have any tools. So what am I saying? If you tried opening a graphics file in a graphics program and you didn't have any tools and you were pinch hitting and uh, you were doing this for your own curiosity, then, then you could. And, and it's, it's usually helpful if you, you know, if you think a system, a lot of IT people will do this when they're first responders on the scene, they're like, what's going on with this? And they start messing with the data files to try to get a handle on what's misfiring and why it's misfiring and, and so on. Um, yeah, so, so you can, but it's usually just, it's not a part of proper forensic method, I guess is the best way to explain that. An image recovery tool like Recall, Recall is not used for image recovery, not picture images recall takes snapshots of random access memory data there's a data image in, in live memory that recall grabs and there are some references out on the open internet about how recall can capture images of ram contents but that word image is generically used to mean okay the whole disk the entire contents of RAM, that kind of thing. Um, and I want you to know that recall doesn't have to do with graphic pictures, it has to do with RAM. So that's the wrong tool for the job. Any questions about this item? None that I can think of. Okay. Multiple choice, Tempests. Um, there are times where you put uh, certain personal electronic devices in like a mesh or wire bag. Um, phones can be erased remotely. 
devices can be impaired or data can be corrupted remotely. Uh, Tempest is this um, susceptibility to radio waves for wireless devices. And there's brief mention of this in your study guide and or addendum. Uh, there's also mention of it in the last part of chapter two, where it talks about Tempest as uh, resources that you might need for a uh, forensic laboratory, but it has more to do with the context or the situational awareness. So um, what's a good example of when you'd use, uh, when you'd be concerned about Tempest? Well, if you had a cell phone and it was found on the scene and it had data you needed to recover, you'd want to put it in a, a metal box. You'd want to shield it from radio waves, basically. And so this concern about Tempest is, um, is actually, it's an acronym that has to do with electromagnetic emanation. That's EM, electromagnetic emanation. So if you have a perpetrator who's trying to hide their tracks, uh, they know, oh, snap, they found the phone. We're gonna try to erase it before people can access the data, right? So sometimes you see this in TV shows. Oh yeah, what'd you find? Well, the perpetrator wiped the data. So we're dealing with a technically gifted perpetrator. Any questions about Tempest? No, okay. sir. Okay, S W G D E is a scientific work working group on digital evidence. Uh, the S W G D E reference is in that's in one of our references, either the addendum or the. I think it's in your. There's mention of it in the addendum or the study guide. It's also in your textbook digital evidence that works to ensure the quality consistence of forensic community whose member organizations include federal agencies. Um, that's correct. So if you look at this, if you look this up online, you find out who the partner or affiliated organizations are, you'll see some, some federal agencies listed there. That's a true statement. Any questions about this item? No, no, sir. Multiple choice. Forensic investigator must determine which prepared word lists should be kept on hand as inputs for extraction tools with upcoming investigations. This ties into uh, the task in acquisition that's considered, and it's related to data carving. You have a system. How many gigs of data do I have on here? We did this in class, didn't we? I said, how many files do I have in this directory, right? How many folders and how many directories and files do I have? Does anyone remember me doing this in class? Uh, I can't recall. Okay. And then also Windows, take the Windows directory. And, and you look, the point is, is it's a huge number of directories and files. When you're doing forensics acquisition, part of the challenge is, is the context, the situational awareness. What are you looking for? Where are you looking on that system? It's, it's one of the toughest tasks for forensic specialists. And that's, that's, that's part of the element of this question here. Choose the following statement that is most accurate about this interest. The motive, means, and opportunity will vary based on the scenario. Prefabricated word lists must not be used. That's the best choice for this question because depending on the situation, if you use a standard word list like hackers use to guess passwords, 
uh, it's going to be all over the map. But let's say you're dealing with uh, a chain of uh, butcher shops. Everybody knows what a butcher shop is, right? They yes, carve, sir. They carve meat, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So you would think that things like knives, cleavers, <laughs> sirloin, right? there's all there's all sorts of words that are going to key into uh, that forensic scenario as opposed to a dry cleaning store, as opposed to a restaurant, a generic restaurant with a point of sale that was compromised, as opposed to a hospital, as opposed to a hospital cap cafeteria, the, the context changes. So prefabricated word lists are, are, are not a good idea, but, but what's most important is understanding motive means and opportunity. So you have to look at the situation and then ask yourself, okay, what's the likely cause of this event? What would they need to do this to perform this? What kind of opportunities would they need to actually perform the task, even if they had the means, right? And so those are, those are relevant uh, issues. The FBI Uniform Crime Reporting site is an excellent reference to build word lists. Um, yeah, that's not what the FBI Uniform Crime Reporting site is good for. It's good for reporting uniform statistics on crime. That's what it's good for. Um, a standard rainbow table that contains all possible combinations of characters to be used. That's the same as a prefabricated word list. We're not trying to crack passwords. ISO 20, this is a bogus answer, specifies the criteria for robust word lists as part of the forensic tool. What is ISO 27349 used for? Now, if I screw this up, and put the wrong ISO standard in there that I'm going to have to give everybody credit for that. But let's just let's just make sure that I wasn't on me because I'm noticing a whole bunch of people um, answered this. So Um, images for ISO standard. Um, what does that have to do with uh, forensics? Nada. So that's not a good answer choice because it's a bogus, bogus uh, answer. Any questions about this item? No, sir. Professional tenets of Kali use, right? So we need, before you started installing the Kali, either on a live USB or on a virtual machine, we asked you to sign uh, to, to agree to professional ethical use, right? And that was part of the defined activity for our course it was an assignment. Let's look at this one. So this was a multi-answer question. The digital tools supplied with Kali Linux distribution require tenants of professional use, five stipulations to faithfully observe before work begins. Uh, this is in the early sections of the study guide. Select any of the statements below that are part of these tenets. Avoid use of persistent memory with live images used with USB drives. Uh, that's stated in more than one place. If you include persistent memory in the USB for Kali live distributions, then the tools themselves can be compromised in the event that there's malware on the system you're trying to investigate. Does anybody remember that we talked about in class? Someone, anyone? Vague, very vaguely. Okay, good. So when you configure a Kali thumb drive, you can add persistent memory 
if you want to use the poly tools to rescue data that's helpful because while you're live on the screen you can drag and drop stuff into your poly thumb drive and save some data files but normally we're not on a data recovery mission we're on a forensic you know and then one of the things in there it talks about um, in the study guide when you use Kali and you pull up a system with the live distribution or you connect the disk to a virtual machine a virtual appliance that's running Kali it's going to show the hard disk right there on the screen on the desktop and people have this like oh there it is there's the disk I want <laughs> and they go to the desktop and they see this big fat thing sitting there and the 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 first uh the first thing they do is uh double click and start investigating the the disk um that's a reflex that you're supposed to avoid for all sorts of reasons a lot of times when you're connecting something you have a specific purpose your scope of work is clearly defined in a format of record you don't just go opening somebody's disk and start thumbing through their files that's just not that's not a that's clearly stated in the study guide any questions okay it says configure a Kali usb with persistent memory to allow efficient and timely capture of evidence no you would use acquisition tools with Kali, but you're you're not using persistent memory on the USB to do that. So that's kind of a tricky answer, but an incorrect answer. It's not a best practice. Um, you're typically using the Kali thumb drive, and if you want to use it to acquire all the digital evidence on the drive, you would connect an external hard disk. Assess the potential for active malicious network activity with built-in scanning tools. The moment you turn up network scanning tools, most of the tools for network forensics are also network hacking tools and they sound alarms and that's a problem and that was something we said is a particular problem you want to avoid and so that's not an answer you want because we've already called that out as a thing to avoid um i'm going to hit the pause button here very quickly and um i'll be right back please stand by Okay. Um, minimum. Any questions about that last one? Professional tense to call use. No, sir. No, sir. Okay. Following is considered a part of the minimum recommended resources and equipment for a basic forensic lab. Um, this is a part of the end of chapter two. Talks about an air gap workstation. If you're doing a whole lab. You want something that's disconnected from the network. If you're to that scale, uh, professional forensic labs also include hardware based write block, which means that there's a hardware tool that prevents um, changes or corruption of data on a subject hard disk that's being uh, acquired. So, in case e discovery. Um, a lot of basic forensic labs don't use NCASE, they use other forensic suites, but many do. Um, it's not part of the minimum recommended. So you got to remember the question the way it's stated, part of the minimum recommended, right? Sans SIFT is, that's one option, but it's not a minimum recommended resource and the sleuth kit with autopsy those aren't minimum recommended resources those are options all of those are options for tools why is the sleuth kit with autopsy something too complicated to be considered minimum or because i do remember seeing it when i was going through the notes as a part of yeah there are other tools, uh, commercial suites, commercial tool suites that also have 
live RAM memory capture options. So minimum, minimum recommended resources. Um, I can see where this would would trigger that kind of a response. Um, the The only problem with that answer choice is that there are a lot of different tools for live RAM capture. And um, uh, if it were worded to say an appropriate forensic tool suite including live ram capture capabilities then that would be different does that make sense yes it does okay so i guess you know the word minimum here is what we were shooting for i'll 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 take greater care on the retake for the retake items to rephrase that when when will that be by the way very soon <laughs> so i'll start posting the retakes for module one and module two and uh, if you go ahead and quickly review the study guides and more importantly your own assessment and the, your reconciliations right Re reference your own reconciliations um last semester we had folks that did retakes but they did them in a hurry and you could tell that they didn't really take the time to reference reconciliations because they did it like an hour before the deadline after they had almost a week and and they finished the retake in 15 minutes flat and did worse so please please take advantage of what a retake opportunity is especially for this assessment right so everybody can hit everybody can go back and hit it out of the ballpark and get a much higher score and be much uh, more prepared for the cumulative which will hit thursday you'll be taking the cumulative 90 minute assessment on thursday so i'm glad you asked that um Keyword search this is multiple choice. So a forensic tool offers the ability to search raw disk images by keywords. This feature is an example of what forensic tool function. All right, so when we're talking about acquisition generically, you have, you have major stages or, or phases of forensic effort you acquire data you analyze data you report on what you found for the data so there's three main stages or phases of forensic activity well of course you have the the preliminary right you have the preliminary and preparation phase or stage before you ever do that but then when you're called on the scene you acquire the data you analyze the data and then you report on your findings you interpret you interpret the analysis results for the stakeholders because they're not going to understand what they're seeing. You're like, no, it means you have to make these changes or they're going to eat your lunch every month around payday. Your, your payroll is going to get hacked every month if you don't make these changes. Those are the kinds of things that happen in, in reporting. You're actually interpreting the results of all of the tasks for each of those phases. Extraction is considered one of the most difficult and that has to do with the fact that you're interpreting the situation and you you have to come up with those keywords right so so this is really relevant and i'm glad we had the chance to hit this question in particular uh, before our time's up and i'm going to try to pick up the pace and talk a little faster so we can cover some more assessment items quickly and uh if any of you have to drop at quarter after exactly in four minutes i'll understand some of you joined us late i hope you can hang late i'll just keep going over the assessment items until we're finished and then i'll post the recording for all of it so i understand if people have other schedule uh, commitments they they need to see about but anyway 
let's get back to extraction. Um, the live memory acquisition that has to do with RAM acquisition. Uh, searching raw disk images for RAM. Does everybody see the conflict here? Live memory acquisition has to do with RAM. What's in your what's in the DIMMs on the RAM modules? We're talking about disk images. We're talking about the hard disk, persistent memory, uh, non-volatile memory on a disk. So, so live memory acquisition would not be a good answer choice. Tripwire baselines, tripwire is a specialty tool um, that doesn't have to do with keywords, it has to do with hashing. Steganography, um, keywords, uh, you might try to figure out how to break a password, but that's password cracking if you want to gain access to hidden data inside a picture that was protected with a password, but that's not the same as a disk image, a raw disk image. It's a whole disk capture, right? So keywords, it has to do with extraction. Extraction is related to disk carving or data carving. It, when you have the gajillion, billion, zillion directories and files on a single system, and then you have potentially dozens or even hundreds of systems in an organization. Oh my gosh, you know, where do you start? Well, it's all about the situational awareness. It's all about uh, the, 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 the incident. What kind of issue does it pose was it a violation of law did it violate you know potential uh policy you know operational policy is it an internal versus a public investigation because you're dealing with law that was broken right or was there motive means and opportunity all of those context concepts have to be formulated as key words or your extraction, which is a phase of data acquisition, doesn't really work very well. So you're acquiring an entire disk, but then when you're, before you're analyzing the data, you're narrowing down the pool of data. That's what extraction and disk carving or data carving is all about. Are there any questions about this item? No, sir. See, that's live. So when you're doing keywords in a situation based on the scenario, there's no textbook for that, right? But, but you're using the forensic tool function that has to do with extraction. And in some circles, they, they say, oh yeah, you're data carving, you're disk carving, whatever. You're extracting data from what you, the whole disk you acquired, acquisition of data isn't just grabbing an entire disk it, th there's more to it and it goes further um and you can't analyze the whole disk i mean you can not analyze the whole disk but you're going to get too much information it's not going to be useful all right um gui forensic tool multiple answer this is a challenging according to the textbook authors the following are disadvantages of using gui based commercial forensic tool suites this is in your textbook and it's mentioned either in the addendum or the study guide or both such forensic tool options incur excessive resource requirements they're very expensive yes and there are tool dependencies and they they reduce versatility so they often have um, their own proprietary formats they're not open source formats. So when you present digital evidence in court, unless somebody has, you know, an end case, unless somebody else that's examining that evidence has also uses end case, you can save the stuff you're, basically there are dependencies and it reduces uh, versatility. It says produce, produce results that may not stand up to scrutiny if legal action results that's not an accurate statement. The fact that somebody has a proprietary data format doesn't mean it doesn't stand and stand up in court. Uh, end case and commercial suite tools, especially the GUI slick ones, the easy button tool suites. Yes, I have. I've narrowed it down to this directory. 
And now I need as much information out of this one directory from this one employee. I'm going to click an easy button. Uh, they're going to make it easy for you. Eliminate the need to learn an older OS and are easy to use. They are easy to use. Um, but they don't eliminate the need to, to learn an older OS. Um, you would be shocked at how many old operating systems are in operation. And uh, commercial GUI suite may not be good at, at uh, acquiring or analyzing data on older systems is actually, oftentimes you have to buy extra modules to analyze older systems at a cost. So it's all about you're locked into a specific proprietary way of working and it costs an arm and a leg. Those are the two important things to remember. But when your business grows to the point where you have funded an entire lab, you're not just working out of your home office, your, your professional interests have grown and you serve a greater range of stakeholders you know, you're charging 100 to $200 an hour for what you do, and you're busy 60 hours a week. You can hire extra people. You, you have a six-figure salary and benefits package. Your income annually exceeds a million dollars. Any questions? No questions, sir. Why would it exceed a million dollars? Well, if you come up with one piece of evidence that tips the scale in um, a custody battle in a divorce or the division of family assets because somebody said they weren't cheating and oh yeah, they were, here's the proof. That can come down to a lot of money. And it usually, people are willing to worth, people are willing to pay three to $5,000 for services to prove a thing they know to be true. All right, the ordering, a little shocked at how the ordering went. Let's uh, look at the ordering of an, all right, so certain tool functions are required sooner in a forensic investigation, some are required later. Based on a typical sequence of forensic tasks, list the order of functions used first, next, and so on. Reporting is the last one. It looks like a bunch of folks got that correct. There were only two that didn't nail that. Um, yeah, reconstruction. So that's part of that's part of analysis. So when you're analyzing the data, you're especially if it's hidden data, especially if it's hacker, I'm hiding data. I'm oh, there's kitty pornography kind of the, the reconstruction is part of the analysis. So reconstruction is a task associated with analysis. That's toward the end. Uh, validation of tool function. If you don't do that at the beginning, you're wasting. Uh, excuse time. me. Y yes. Yeah. The side by guy leave. Get over class thing. I, oh. I gotta go to my job real quick. So uh, that's okay. We'll go ahead and uh, finish recording, and we'll you'll we'll yeah. So from this point on, uh, you just watch the end of the recording. Okay. Acquisition is that first um, that first phase. Then you're going to validate and verify. Why are you validating and verifying after you acquire? Well, you want to prove that what you captured was good. Does that make sense? Extraction comes after. It's the later phase of acquisition. So it's the deeper. It's the deeper dive in. You're acquiring, but you're narrowing your acquisition down. So that's the first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth tasks. Any questions? No questions. Okay. Multiple choice, what next? A forensic professional, a DES specialist, so this is, an, this is a forensic analyst, begins work with open source tools and methods. The practice grows quickly. As many new clients need essential services, what is a recommended change for this professional? Uh, 
we, we just to explain that in a previous uh, question on, on, on related question, basically after a point, if you want to automate the process and have a standard format, and I mean, if you become certified in commercial forensic tools, you're going to work more, you're going to work with greater efficiency. And especially if the practice grows and you have more new clients, if you bring anybody else on board, you're going to have to be on the same page. One of the problems with open source tools and methods is that if you happen to be an expert in Kali, but you hire on new staff because your new clients grow, and they're really great with Sans Sift, but Sans Sift is a different tool set. Oh, no, and then there's a third person who works with Kane. Well, that's law enforcement forensics, right? Those open source tools are kind of finely tuned for a given purpose. The problem is, is if you have a mixed bag of open source tools and methods, and then you have more people on your staff, it gets to be a problem. If you adopt a commercial forensic tool suite, you need more than one copy because you have more than one person on staff. You train and certify, you get lots of easy buttons that you can automate your forensic work with, and that's that's a strong advantage it's only once your practice grows that the extra expense is justified it's called a return on investment any questions about this so i'm going to spend fifty thousand dollars on my software but i'm going to make two hundred fifty thousand more because i'm working more efficiently and i can clear more cases there's a return on the investment Okay. Um, DEFR scope. There's a difference in scope between the first responder incident handler. That's what. It, that's the a way of describing DEFRs. First responders are incident handlers, right? And their focus is on preserving evidence, but also recovering and. Um, making changes for better resilience. So they're gonna balance preservation of digital evidence with the need for damage control and recovery, incident handling. That's what a DEFR is gonna do compared to a DES. The DES is gonna to wanna to get into the weeds, right? Balancing security with intrusion detection, uh, that's, that's too specific. That has to do with network stuff. Some of your issues may not have anything to do with network hacks. Balance critical operations of essential equipment with the need to prosecute those who violate acceptable use. Usually when somebody violates acceptable use policies, they get fired and they face personnel action, but that doesn't mean you're prosecuting them because they broke the law. Does that distinction help? Well, actually nobody chose that one. Balance preservation of digital evidence with the need for thorough and deep analysis of hidden data. The person who's interested in the thorough and deep analysis of hidden data, that's the DES. So that's not the, that's not the DEFR scope, that's, that's what the DES says. Does that help with this question? Yes, sir. Okay. Glad it's helpful. Moving right along. An absolute minimum. So five professional tenants, two things they have to be able to do. They have to be able to detect changes and view digital resources. Now it's not in that order. They have to be able to view digital resources and they have to detect changes to those resources. Those are the two essential activities they have to be able to perform in order to be able to do anything decent. Um, this comes first, this comes second. The only thing that's potentially confusing about this answer is that I put detect changes and digital viewing of resources in reverse order. 
Um, nobody fell for this one. That's good. Access any devices or systems via a privileged account. Um, no. A DEFR and a DES actually can do everything they need to do if it comes down to it without having a privileged account. It's always good to coordinate and to have privileged accounts to perform activities in a domain, in a centralized or centrally managed, you know, for organizations that are large and efficient that have um, enterprise domains for security account management. But yeah, it's always good to do that, but, but that's not the absolute minimum. If you walked in and somebody in the IT shop was corrupt and they were actually hosing any attempts to forensically analyze the data, a forensic, a first responder or a specialist, either one of those could basically capture all the data they would need and never require a privileged account. You just grab disk images and then analyze them until you find out, oh, the culprit's actually in the IT department. A lot of IT people are not real fond of forensic folks poking around their systems because oftentimes their own professional deficiencies become glaring outcomes of the analysis. So they may not be motivated to help, but in any case, that's not a necessity. Connect using both wired and wireless services to allow full analysis. Again, that's, that's an extreme overstated requirement. It was nothing we actually ever articulated in class. As long as you have network access, it, you don't need both wired and wireless in order to be able to do a full analysis. You don't even need network analysis to do a full analysis if your only scope of interest is to analyze the contents of a single hard disk. So this is actually irrelevant for some cases. Any questions about this item? No, that was an easy one. Yeah. Um, Deleted graphics and video. So we're getting down into the final stretch. We'll run all the way up to here, which is international standard. A couple more, we'll, we'll move as quickly as possible. So which tool function and example is suitable to recover deleted graphics and video data? The EXIF tool is ideally suited for reconstruction. That's in your addendum or it's listed um, on the matrix as well. Right. It's not used for extraction and autopsy. It's not used for acquisition. It's it's to help you figure out how to re what's really going on with the graphics and the video data. A lot of times, uh, graphic and video data is corrupted on purpose. It's digital evidence that proves another crime, and somebody's mauled that evidence to cover up their crime. And it's your job as a digital forensic specialist to reconstruct the graphics so you catch the criminal because they're trying to destroy the digital evidence. I don't know if that helps, but some of the challenges in a question like this have to do with uh, imagining the scenario. Or So when you're talking about recovering deleted graphics and video, how, why are pictures and video deleted? And why are you recovering? It's the scenario, right? Think, think about the scenario. You're not worried about acquisition. It's not, it's not existent. <laughs> it's deleted. It's on the, it's on the disk. It's just deleted. The first uh, character of the file in the file system was removed, but it's still in there. Parts of it are still in there. So this is this tool in particular is really good for that. Any questions? No, sir. Acceptable use policy and banner when preparing a forensic investigation and selecting appropriate tools, provide an important consideration related to login banners and or acceptable use policies. One of the things that we try to tell you is how important these two are, but how when it comes to Fourth Amendment rights, it's not it's not a catch-all. You don't get to have an acceptable use policy and a login banner 
and then get to violate everyone's privacy, especially when it comes down to Fourth Amendment rights. So even though these are important preparation um, and procedural things to consider up front, uh, if you if you're operating as a forensic professional in an environment with login banners and acceptable use policies, and one of the IT people says, hey, I don't care if that's her personal data. They agreed that we could look at anything. And when it, if it comes to Fourth Amendment rights, unlawful search and seizure, you have to be able to say, mm, yeah, now we're getting into the place where we need a subpoena. Because you're talking about crimes that triggers due process, part of due process is the Bill of Rights and the Fourth Amendment. And just because you have a little banner doesn't mean you get to get into everybody's Kool-Aid. Oh, she left her phone. This is a workplace environment. You know, uh, they signed an agreement that said that, they, you know, they agreed to inspection of data and devices. Okay, so it was generically stated. You don't get to grab their personal device. What about bring your own device for the workplace? The device is owned by the employee. It's not even owned by the employer, right? Gets kind of sticky. So it's this Fourth Amendment, right? Um, this statement is blatantly false. We've gone out of our way to say, just because you have that, I just explained all that, right? Many forensic tools require validation of consent to login banners and AUP prior to use. Um, no, no, that's not a requirement of forensic tool use. Um, it's considered best practice to have validation of consent. But a lot of times you don't have that. In fact, the first time that you are called on the scene, most clients are desperate. They didn't pay for you to coordinate forensic services up front. So when something happens, they have someone on tap. Most organizations don't consider forensics to be as important as legal, right? They retain legal counsel up front. They don't retain forensic counsel up front until they have an issue. And then they realize, holy buckets, I have, you know. And then, then you have a, an informed and progressive organization loops you in on the front side. Most organizations are, your first encounter with most of your clients is gonna be like the first encounter that a nurse in an ER in an emergency room has. People aren't in an emergency room because they want to be there. They're in there because they're desperate. Does that make sense? So, all right. Forensic tools may not be used unless a proper AUP and login banner are clearly displayed. NIST 800-171. All right. So let's pretend for a second that NIST 800-171 actually has to do with this. Um, and it may have, let's pretend that it does. In the interest of time, I'm not going to look this up. It's a bogus answer. Um, Unless an organization receives federal funds, they're not required to follow federal standards specified by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, the NIST special publications. If they do, then they must. But we don't specify either way, whether this is a private or a commercial or a public organization. Any questions? No questions. Okay. Professional professional tenants. All DEFR and DES must practice five professional tenants before any forensic activity begins. Choose answer options below that reflect these tenants. So that's pretty easy. All you had to do is reference the section of the study guide. It's not in your textbook. These are operational tenants. These are things that, you know, as Cyber security professionals for 20 years, I have personally witnessed. Anyway, isn't notification of all stakeholders a part of it? Um, okay, 
So let's talk about that one. Let's say that you are called to begin forensic activity and among the stakeholders is somebody who has committed a federal felony. Are you gonna notify the stakeholders, all the stakeholders, including the potential suspects? That's a good question. That's a great question. And I'm very glad you asked it. Before any forensic activity begins, do you have to notify everyone? Oh, hell no. <laughs> Ideally, in an organization, everyone should be aware that the digital use of the digital systems constitutes uh, your consent to review of the digital uh, the data. And, and, and that's always good as a best practice. That's not a requirement. And, and you don't have to notify everybody. And in case where there's a digital crime that was committed, you're not gonna wanna notify everyone. You, you, you may have somebody who's still lurking on the system and they may have an accomplice. And if you notify everybody, here's the, here's the key word, right? If I said notification of appropriate stakeholders who have hired you for your services legally, well, that would be fine. Notification of all stakeholders? No. You're trying to catch somebody, especially if they're bad. Let me tell you, if I'm called ever to the scene to investigate a potential for child pornography, I'm going to go into deep, run silent, run deep, and they'll never know what hit them. Everybody got me? Just saying, that's part of the professional ethos, right? The ethos. Um, but people got to know and have a trust in your integrity to have confidence that you're using your knowledge, skills, and abilities for the right purpose. So, so you have to you have to know the situational. We get back to the situational awareness issue again. It all comes back to situational awareness. And that's something, unfortunately, you can't really teach in a textbook. I mean, they have case studies in a lot of textbooks now, and those case studies are useful. But, but then there's an analysis of the case study that follows. That's why in the next two modules, you're going to be working in a scenario that's it's a simulated live environment. We want you to develop some of those knowledge, skills, and abilities by actually applying some of that situational awareness. Consultation with law enforcement to determine if any current activity is suspicious. You wouldn't do that before any forensic activity begins. I mean, it might not, you might be hired to see if the IT shop is doing a good job and you wanna see if there's any telltale signs that you have, you know, digital compromise on the scene, but that doesn't mean you gotta to go to law enforcement first. Um, what would law enforcement know about the local organization? Uh, we get we get calls for uh, like uh, workplace violence there all the time. Yeah, uh, okay. You might loop in law enforcement at some point, but not initially, not before any activity begins. And I know a lot of people chose this one, but I want you to understand we didn't talk about a situation where there was violent or criminal elements here. So it's all about context. A lot of times you don't have violent or criminal, so you wouldn't call in law enforcement. I hope that helps. Support contracts with all hardware and software vendors who provided in infrastructure components. I have seen cases where people insist on having this on hand up front, and it's kind of stupid, but it's a local policy. And because they handle very highly classified or sensitive information, that's that does happen, but it usually happens in the context of top secret uh, research and development, usually national security, stuff like that. That wouldn't be the case for any forensic activity, right? That would be a special case. Any questions about this item? No, you already answered mine. Okay. All righty. 
most challenging method or function to perform with a forensic tool is considered to be extraction. Sniffing is scarily easy to do. Hashing is, well, hashing is really easy to do. Uh, decryption is not difficult at all if you have a rainbow table. You just look up the value of whatever is hashed, right? So in some cases, now, if you're doing cryptanalysis, that's different. That's not the same as decryption. If you have a key, uh, if you have a recovery key because you're part of an Active Directory domain environment, all of the management admins in the IT staff are designated key recovery agents. They can give you a key to decrypt at will. So EFS or uh, whole disk encryption, none of that saves anybody. In that kind of an environment, everybody has a false sense of security. It's like, yeah, I, I encrypted um, my data. There was a case in California recently where employees of a health department came in and whacked everybody at a Christmas party. Just open fire with automatic weapons. The encrypted data that the law enforcement needed to recover, it wasn't a company phone. It wasn't a phone that was owned by the health department. It was their personal property. And Apple had encrypted the data. And under the way they were ordered to provide a master key to encrypt all, to decrypt everything, they said, no, we're not gonna do that. Because the law enforcement was demanding, the federal law enforcement was demanding a universal key to decrypt all Apple data for all Apple devices and systems. And Apple said, no, we're not going to do that. I mean, we'll help you break this thing so you can see what's on this one phone. And the law enforcement agency said, yeah, you are. This is why we have problems with encryption. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court. Now Apple has to provide the means in cases where it's extreme and there's a proper subpoena to provide a key. That was a landmark uh, forensic law enforcement challenge. It just happened a couple of years ago. Extraction is considered the most challenging. Now, one of the most advanced skill sets to perform is acquisition of live data in RAM. But if you're using NCASE, you just click a button. If you're using uh, FTK, uh, the professional toolkit, you just click a button. Bam. And, and you have it. So, so depending on whether you're using a commercial versus an open source forensic tool, the level of difficulty can change or be different. Does everybody remember when I pulled up the SANS white paper and it showed level of difficulty for tool use? And this was like five years ago. Everybody remember that? Vaguely? Yeah, I'm trying to do you a favor here. It's posted in the module. You might want to look at those pages that were explicitly stated and spend more time in the matrix, right? For the retick. Last item. Woohoo! Unless somebody wants me to cover these two as well. And thank you for your willingness to hang tight and uh, walk through the rest of this, which international standard, this is federal, it's US federal only. This has to do with the standards organization, but it's not internet. It's international in nature, uh, but it doesn't establish thorough forensic tool validation. This has to do with cyber certifications generically. The IACIS CFCE, that's a bogus answer. Nobody fell for that. This is a correct answer, but only federal. It's not international. Let me say that again. On your retake assessment, I just want you to be aware that this is international and this is federal, right? So if you come across another question and, and the question read, which 
federal standard establishes blah, 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 then that would be a different case, right? Does anyone care to see the last two items just to see them? Since you've gone the distance, what do you say? Sure, I'll stick around. Okay. Before you were allowed to begin forensic work for a large client, you were asked what the most common steps a malicious actor with technical skills would perform to exploit company systems. First of all, I want to tell you how warm and affectionate I feel that most everybody in the class got this one right. Because, you know, when you're selecting tools and you're trying to figure out a strategy, it's the situational awareness. You, know, you, know, you have to know what the tools are used for and what tasks you're performing, but you also need to understand when you have malicious actors in the mix, what tasks are they performing? What malicious activities are they pursuing and in what order? And, and uh, I'm so glad that all of you got this right. Um, so this is, yeah. Um, concealment, maybe this is logically sensible. Concealment, people conceal what they're doing before they start. But usually that's not even possible. Um, there's a certain amount of exposure that people have on digital systems and devices. And it may be the case that some really, really good, I, I'm thinking the person who selected this thought, you know, the very best hackers you never know are there. And, and I, I think that um, there could be a case for that. But then the rest of these are in the wrong order, right? Scanning, access, preservation, no, that's out of order. If it was concealment, then scanning, exploitation, access preservation, or, or said scanning, yeah, if somebody said concealment, and then we said reconnaissance, scanning, exploitation, and access preservation, maybe the very best world-class, you know, APT number one from China, the guy that works in the Red Army, he is the number one hacker on the planet, APT one. He's on the FBI most wanted list. And he works for the Chinese government. He is employed in the Red Army and he is a cyber wizard. Extraordinary. He may do it this way, but then he does reconnaissance next, then scanning, then exploitation, then access preservation. Or, or maybe he's so good because he does concealment and then access preservation so he can always get in there and finish the job. I don't know. He could be exceptional because he doesn't do what most everybody does. The most common steps for a malicious actor are in this order. Yeah, okay. And the last item, five common functions can be organized into five categories by function, acquisition, validation, verification, extraction, reconstruction, and reporting. Um, hashing, that's not the primary. It's good to have a baseline, but you get a baseline not with digital tools. So I, I want to speak about this a second. Having a baseline and having hashes of selected data files on your system, that's useful. That's something that you do before you use digital forensic tools after you've been hacked. If you wanna know you've been hacked in the first place, your best tool of detection is the tool between your ears. When you see that something's out of whack and you have a standard baseline for a system and you're like, okay, what's wrong with this system? I'm being hired to find out what's wrong. And you look at this and you're like, oh my gosh, the CPU is running at a third. Last week, it was only 5%. Oh my gosh, almost four gigs of memory is taken up. The baseline shows a half of a gig. 500 megs of RAM is normally consumed. Look at the sending. Oh my gosh, the outstream traffic. Normally, a baseline doesn't have a lot of sending data. We're usually pulling down and receiving data. We're, we're 
we're streaming media. We're pulling stuff down off the internet most of the time. Why is this sending so high? Well, in this case, the send is high because I'm transmitting live my screen to you as a part of our session, right? So I can explain that as a baseline. And if I had hashes of certain things, I could include that. But that's not that's not normally what we're doing. This is the answer. All right. Um, I'm going to post alternate versions for the first and second assessment. And then uh, by the end of this week, you'll see the first cumulative exam online. It'll be worth 10 points of your final average, 10% of your final average. You're, you're going to want to spend some quality time looking over the reconciliation, looking over your previous assessment. And then um, if you get anything wrong with the retakes, you want to zone in on those. The retake assessment items are going to be very much largely a preview of assessment items you're going to have in your cumulative. They they are not going to be 100% identical. I don't want to um, start a false expectation here, but but in some cases they may be frighteningly similar or even identical, depending on whether or not uh, folks whether or not that's an assessment item that's that that maps back to these stated learning objectives for the modules are there any questions before we clear would anyone like to remain in the session to review any aspects of the solution work or any of the uh, assignments i'm good <laughs>